Hi, my name is Lama, and I'm a laboratory genetic counselor at the Mount Sinai Genetic Testing Lab. I'd like to discuss with you the Next Step Comprehensive Pan-Ethnic Carrier Screen today. The topics I'd like to cover include some background information on Mount Sinai, as well as the lab, some carrier screening information including relevant inheritance patterns. Next, we'll go over the different panel testing options for carrier screening. We'll then review some diseases of special interest and finish up with some ordering logistics. So first, some background about Mount Sinai. The Mount Sinai Health System is one of the largest health systems in New York, with over 140 ambulatory practice locations and over 5,000 faculty. Mount Sinai strives to continuously invest in the future of healthcare. As for the Mount Sinai Genetic Testing Lab, we are housed in the Department of Genetic and Genomic Sciences and have three arms, molecular genetics, cytogenetics and cytogenomics, as well as biochemical genetics. Our staff is over 100, including licensed clinical laboratory directors, genetic counselors, technologists, as well as postdoctoral fellows. Um, and we have a state-of-the-art facility that enable us to have high throughput of large volumes of specimens. In the three arms, these are just some examples of the tests that we can perform. So under molecular genetics, we do a lot of carrier screening, which will be the focus of today's discussion. But as well, we do craniosynostosis testing, porphyria testing, um, limb defects testing, amongst others. For our cytogenetics and cytogenomics arm, we have routine karyotyping, fish, uh, microarray, as well as some other testing options. And finally, in our biochemical genetics arm, we do quite a bit of Tay-Sachs enzyme analysis, as well as screening for uh, organic acidemias, am amino acid panels, carnitine and acylcarnitine panels, etc. Some features of working with the Mount Sinai Genetic Testing Lab include that we uh, accept a lot of New York State insurances. We do a lot of outreach visits to make sure that your practice is happy with the service that we are providing. We have centralized accessioning and dedicated client service staff. We're constantly paying attention to our turnaround times to make sure those are as short as possible. Our reports are continuously improving with regular feedback from our clients and uh, we make sure that our reports are clear and summary based. Um, finally, we can deliver very personalized service in terms of how many pickups does a certain client need, how would they like their results delivered, be it electronic, manual. Um, we also have strategic partnerships with outside vendor labs for testing that we just don't offer in our own lab. We strive to be that one-stop shop lab. Um, behind all this is, of course, people who care, and here's just a picture of part of our lab, um, just to put a face to the name, uh, because we all handle these specimens with the utmost of care. So some background information about carrier screening. The most relevant inheritance pattern for carrier screening is autosomal recessive inheritance. If we go back to basic biology, we remember that we have two copies of every gene, one we inherited from our mother and one we inherited from our father. Most individuals have both parental copies spelled out the right way, and the DNA sequence is producing the right protein in the right amount, and they don't suffer from genetic disease. A small percentage of the healthy population, however, has a mutation or a DNA change in one of the copies of a relevant gene, which is preventing that gene from providing the correct protein output. However, that individual is usually unaffected because the opposite parental gene is spelled out the correct way and is actually compensating for that mutated copy. Those individuals in the healthy population are called carriers. The pur purpose of carrier screening is to identify amongst the healthy population the small percentage of carriers. We want to know about this kind of information primarily for reproductive purposes. For genes that follow an autosomal recessive inheritance pattern, if both the man and the woman are carriers for the same condition and hence have a mutation or a genetic change in the same gene, they have a 25% chance of having an affected child with the full-blown condition. Conversely, with every pregnancy, they have a 75% chance of having an unaffected child. Although nobody else in their family might be affected with this condition, couples are still at risk for having an affected child just by the fact that they are both carriers for the same condition. 
The second inheritance pattern I'd like to review is called X-linked inheritance. In this case, the gene in question sits on the X chromosome. Remember that women have two X's and men have one X and one Y. Women are a little bit trickier than men are because if they harbor a mutation on one of their X chromosomes, the second unaffected X chromosome would compensate for it. And a woman may not know that she's a carrier for that X-linked condition. Men, on the other hand, don't have a second X to compensate, in which case if they harbor a mutation on their single and only X chromosome, they will display features of the disease. Usually, families that are affected with X-linked condition display an inheritance pattern where an unaffected mother has an affected son, because every carrier woman has a 25% chance with every pregnancy of having an affected son with the full-blown condition. That woman also has a 25% chance of having a carrier daughter, just like herself, a 25% chance of having an unaffected son, and a 25% chance of having an unaffected daughter. These statistics are completely independent with every pregnancy and solely dependent on which X chromosome happens to be passed down from the woman. Our carrier screening is validated on blood and saliva specimens. In developing the Next Step carrier screen, we realized that although some diseases are more frequent in Ashkenazi Jews or other subgroups, we thought it best that individuals of any ancestry be tested for all conditions because no one disease is just exclusive to one ethnic group. For this reason, the Next Step panel can truly be viewed as a pan-ethnic panel. Our Next Step carrier screening product line consists of four panels. The first of which is called the standard panethnic panel that tests for four disorders. Next, we have our high frequency panel of 10 disorders. Then we have our comprehensive Jewish panel of 96 disorders. And finally, our largest panel option is for 281 disorders, and that's called the expanded panethnic panel. The four disorders on our standard panethnic panel are cystic fibrosis, fragile X syndrome, Smith Lemley Opitz syndrome, and spinal muscular atrophy. I'll briefly go over some of the clinical features of these conditions. Cystic fibrosis is a condition of primarily mucus buildup. So you can think of mucus buildup in the chest. Usually these individuals are in and out of the hospital and need prophylactic antibiotics because of the continuous infections that they're sustaining. Additionally, individuals have trouble in their digestive tract and they have a difficult time absorbing nutrients from the foods that they eat. Another hallmark feature of cystic fibrosis is infertility in males due to congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens. Unfortunately, life expectancy of this condition is into the 30s, and a lot of people will need to have a lung transplant at some point in their lives. The slide here for all of these conditions will show you the carrier frequency, so the chances of someone harbors one mutation for that condition for all four of these conditions. This slide also shows you the detection rate of our testing for that relevant condition in that relevant population. Fragile X syndrome is one of the most frequent inherited forms of intellectual disability in males. As the name alludes, the gene associated with Fragile X syndrome sits on the X chromosome, which is why we are usually seeing unaffected mothers having affected sons. Other than intellectual disability, some hallmark features of Fragile X include boys with long faces and large ears. smith lumley opitz syndrome is a condition that leads to multiple organ systems being affected. So we can think of some unique facial features, heart abnormalities, genital abnormalities, skeletal abnormalities, perhaps renal abnormalities. It truly is a disorder that affects multiple body systems. Intellectual disability is a feature of smith lemley opitz syndrome, and life expectancy is sometimes shortened dependent, depending on how severe certain organ systems are affected. Finally, for SMA, or spinomuscular atrophy, we see muscle degeneration, or muscle wasting, as the name alludes. There's a wide range of age of onset for SMA. In the most frequent um, type of SMA, we see an early infancy onset. Usually these children um, will have symptoms of muscle wasting either at birth or shortly after, and a doctor may diagnose a baby with poor muscle tone because of the muscle wasting. Unfortunately, this most severe type is also the most common and usually children do not live beyond age three or four. 
The less severe subtypes of SMA may not onset until teenage years or early adulthood. In those later onset types of SMA, lifespan is not expected to be shortened. Our high frequency panethnic panel of 10 diseases includes the following disorders, four of which were on the, the smaller panel. So cystic fibrosis, fragile X, SMA, and SLOS are all part of the high frequency 10. I'm not gonna go through each and every one of these conditions, but we'll briefly touch on a couple. You'll see some diseases on this panel are hemoglobinopathies. So alpha globin um, is a gene that we would examine. Beta globin is another gene we would examine, helping us to pick up things like alpha thalassemia, beta thalassemia, sickle cell disease, and the likes. An addition disease to point out is Duchenne muscular dystrophy and its milder form, Becker muscular dystrophy, an X-linked condition also leading to muscle wasting in boys. And then we have some metabolic conditions, uh, medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, phenylalanine hydroxylase deficiency, as well as congenital disorder of glycosylation type 1A. So I do want to review some history regarding um, Jewish testing specifically. Uh, Jewish carrier screening started in the 1970s and 1980s pretty much with Tay-Sachs. That was the first disease that we started doing carrier screening for, primarily by biochemical means for the hexosaminidase A enzyme level. Um, however, due to great efforts from a cultural standpoint, from a genetic standpoint, the, incident, the birth incidence of Tay-Sachs disease has really plummeted, and we've reached a point where actually most babies today born with Tay-Sachs disease are not born to individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry because of the heightened awareness in this ethnic group. Jewish individuals can be further subdivided into three groups. First, we have the Ashkenaz that come from Central and Eastern Europe. We then have the Sephardi coming from Spain and Northern Africa. And then finally, we have the Mizrahi, which are more in the Middle East. Although a lot of research and genetic testing has been available for a very long time for Ashkenazi Jewish individuals, not much was available for Mizrahi and Sephardi subgroups until recently. Mount Sinai Genetic Testing Lab spent a lot of time and energy researching these two subgroups of the Jewish people to further delineate their genetic makeup, their gene pool, and better understand the diseases at which they are at increased risk for. Um, although we have certain diseases that are more frequent in one of the three subgroups, it is best to perform our comprehensive Jewish panel of an individual of any Jewish background. So this slide shows you the 48 conditions that are more common in Ashkenazi Jews and the 38 conditions that are more common in the Sephardi Mizrahi Jews. Um, the middle 10 are actually common to individuals of either subgroup. Because we saw a lot of crossing over between the subgroups, so individuals claiming to be Ashkenazi Jews, but then being flagged for a disorder categorized as Sephardi or Mizrahi and vice versa, it is recommended that people of any Jewish background be tested for all 96 conditions. This is a map that shows you some of the migration patterns of these three subpopulations, but as you can see, there was also a lot of overlap. So our largest panel in the product line is the Next Step Expanded Panethnic Panel of 281 disorders. This slide lists all 281 conditions. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to review the clinical implications of each one of these. However, it just speaks to the fact that we are testing for quite a bit. It is estimated that human beings have about 20 to 25,000 genes in their genome, and as great of a job as we think we're doing, it's also important to keep in mind that we are, we are only testing 281 of those. Some disorders shorten lifespan, some disorders are metabolic conditions, some disorders um, lead to intellectual disability, some disorders lead to physical disability. Each genetic disease is unique in and of itself, and it's important to learn clinical features of a disorder if you or one of your patients is found to be a carrier or even affected with one of these diseases. 
The Next Step Expanded Panethnic Panel of 281 Disorders is one of the most comprehensive panels on the market today. 21 of those 281 conditions are X-linked, the remaining are autosomal recessive, and to best pick up a carrier for any one of these 281 disorders, we have had to combine six different testing technologies. No two genes are the same, and no two genes have the same mutation pattern. To best pick up a certain mutation in any given gene, you can't use just one technology. For this reason, we use next generation sequencing, uh, capillary electrophoresis, MLPA, enzyme analysis, genotyping, as well as traditional Sanger sequencing to have heightened detection rates for any one of these 281 genes. In terms of future steps, remember that if a couple are both carriers for the same autosomal recessive condition, they have a 25% chance with every pregnancy of having an affected child. If a woman is a carrier for an X-link condition, she has a 25% chance with every pregnancy of having an affected son. In addition to validating our test on saliva and blood specimens, we also validated our testing on cultured flasks, amniocytes, and direct chorionic villi. This has allowed many couples to take advantage of prenatal diagnosis for the disease which they are at increased risk for. Other than traditional prenatal diagnostic options such as chorionic villa sampling or amniocentesis, other options include PGD or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which would obviously need to be coupled with in vitro fertilization, as well as egg donation, sperm donation, or adoption. In rolling out this test, I just want to reiterate how much we have had to scale up our operations to accommodate a high volume of specimens um, to meet the demand of our turnaround time. Our current turnaround time is between two to three weeks. We are currently striving to keep that as close as possible to the two week time frame. I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about testing methods and sensitivity. Like I mentioned before, one technology does not fit all genes. Um, so in incorporating these six different technologies, we have been able to achieve the highest detection rate for any given disorder on our panel. Something like Fragile X syndrome is not only measured by CGG repeat analysis, but also via sequencing. Something like sequencing would not work for alpha globin, where most of the mutations are actually deletions, which would not be picked up by traditional sequencing or next generation sequencing. By incorporating all these different technologies, we have put out a very robust test. In this slide, I want to explore the difference between geno genotyping versus sequencing. Traditionally, genotyping, or common mutation analysis, was reserved for carrier screening. It was, it was quick, cheap, and very clear cut. There was a list of mutations that we had to perform testing for, and either we found a mutation or we didn't. On the other hand, full gene sequencing was reserved for diagnostic purposes. In this scenario, this test usually took a very long time, sometimes six to eight weeks. It was very expensive, so one gene being sequenced could cost a couple thousand dollars. And sometimes the results could be not as straightforward. If a variant of uncertain significance, or a VUS, was uncovered, its clinical implications could be difficult to predict. With technological advancements and the availability of next generation sequencing, things have shifted. Now we are able to use this heightened technology, i.e. sequencing, in the carrier screening world. Because we have shortened turnaround time for sequencing of a gene, it has become very cheap, and hence we can test multiple genes at a very reasonable cost. And if we adjust our reporting filters, we can do away with having to interpret VUSs, or these variants of uncertain significance. Some testing logistics. As mentioned before, our turnaround time is between two to three weeks. We welcome blood specimens as well as saliva specimens. 
For blood, we need between three to four tubes of blood. And for saliva, we need a standard Origene kit. I would like to wrap up with some diseases of special interest, the first of which is Tay-Sachs disease. I bring this up because this exemplifies the importance of having two different technologies to have that higher detection rate for a condition. Some individuals are caught as carriers on our enzyme analysis, and some individuals are caught as carriers on our DNA or sequencing analysis. Most individuals who are carriers will be flagged on both assays. However, not everyone, which is why we have not done away with either of these technologies. We really need both to get that greater than 99% detection rate. Gaucher disease is a good example of a disorder that could have a late onset. For example, if a woman is walking into her OBGYN's office for reproductive carrier screening, she's usually expecting to receive a result for her offspring's risks of developing disease. However, by performing carrier screening, she might actually find out that she harbors two mutations and she is actually affected with Gaucher disease, just pre-symptomatic. Like I said previously, there is a late onset form of Gaucher disease that doesn't begin until one hits their 50s or 60s. Most individuals of reproductive age are younger than that, in which case they might actually find out they have the condition, they're just pre-symptomatic. Familial Mediterranean fever is another condition that can have an adult onset. Um, however, it has very successful treatment and variable expressivity. What we mean by that is that although some people do really suffer from severe features of the disorder, some individuals actually suffer very mild symptoms of the condition. Hereditary inclusion body myopathy too is also another condition that is very frequent. So in the Iranian Jewish population, we see a carrier frequency of about one in 10. However, there is a late onset form that may not present until one passes that reproductive age. Another group of diseases that is interesting is the disorders that don't really match up in terms of the numbers. So if we were to take SLOS or smith lem leopold syndrome, in Caucasians, the carrier frequency is about one in 48. One can do the math for a projected birth incidence rate of one in 9,216. However, if you go into the hospitals of the country, you will see that the actual birth incidence rate for SLOS is anywhere between one in 20,000 to one in 60,000 births. That is markedly lower that one would ex than one would expect with a carrier frequency of one in 48. The same is true for some of these other conditions. And the thought is that probably many of these fetuses are miscarrying early in gestation and hence not making it to the point of birth, which is our point of measure. Some carrier screening tips. When thinking of carrier screening, please always consider partner availability. Remember that most of the conditions, even on our largest panel, are autosomal recessive. The contribution of the sperm is just as relevant as the contribution from the egg. So by screening a woman whose partner is not available for testing, you may be giving her some information that she can take very little action on. Also, it's important to keep in mind the two to three week turnaround time for the test. If a woman is presenting late in gestation, it may be wiser to screen her and her reproductive partner at the same time to obtain results in a timely manner for proper decision making. Finally, since 21 of the diseases on our expanded panethnic panel are X-linked, if you had to choose one individual and a couple to start carrier screening with, we would recommend it be the woman. That way, even the X-linked conditions are accounted for. I would like to give a special thanks to Dr. Lisa Edelman, our Executive Director, and Dr. Ruth Kornreich, the Director of Molecular Lab. I also would like to thank the entire Mount Sinai Genetic Testing Lab, because this is truly a team effort in developing such a great test. For more information, please visit our website at nextsteptest.com. Thank you.